I'd like to thank you all uh, for being here this morning. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, I've been coming to social media breakfast for a while now, and I've always enjoyed the, being a part of the crowd and enjoyed the speakers. And more importantly, I've just enjoyed the, the friendliness and the openness of everybody that I've met here. Uh, this is a really great group, and I'm, I'm very honored to be here speaking today. Um, and uh, as you can see, this is my presentation, Social Media Law. It is real, and yes, really can impact your business. And I really mean that. Um, how many of you here are on Twitter? How many of you are using Twitter today? Okay, those of you who are veterans of the social media breakfast already know this hashtag, SMB Dallas. Um, for those of you who may be here for the first time, this is what people tweet under uh, so that it tags all the tweets for this event. And for anyone who uh, watches the video in the future, uh, if you want to learn more about social media breakfast, this is a great, great way to do it. Just go and click on the hashtag and you can find all kind of great information about it. Um, Yes, I am a lawyer. I can't admit that. Please don't throw anything at me right now. Um, so I have to get the disclaimers in. What I say here today is for educational purposes. I'm here speaking to help educate you. Please do not rely on this as legal advice. If you need legal advice on these issues, contact a qualified attorney. Number two, this does not create an attorney-client relationship. State Bar of Texas requires me to stand up here and make sure I'm clear on all these things. This is no attorney-client relationship today. So why am I here? Um, well, I'm really happy to be here and looking out at all of you. And, um, and there's two things, um, and they're probably best explained by this picture. This is why I'm really happy to be talking to you this morning, because most of the times when I'm standing up doing a presentation, I'm looking up at a judge that's looking down at me like that. And he's usually uh, in a not quite a happy, as happy of a mood as everyone here. The other reason is I want to help all of you avoid looking at a judge like that by understanding the risks that are involved in using social media. Um, the two most common questions I'm routinely asked. Number one, as a lawyer in general, can I be sued for X, Y, and Z? Pick it, whatever you want to insert for that X, Y, or Z, the answer is yes. You can be sued for anything, anytime, anywhere. It doesn't have to be legitimate, but you can be sued for it. So if you ever are talking to a lawyer and you want to know something, don't ask the question, can I be sued for it? Because the answer is always yes. Number two, is the risk of using social media worth it? Um, I gave a similar presentation uh, several weeks ago, and after the presentation was over, I was pretty disappointed by one of the, the bits of feedback I got, because someone who was in attendance came up to me and said, you know, after hearing all of this, I don't think I want to use social media anymore. I'm scared of it. And I was like, God, no, that's not the point. That's not what I'm trying to, to get you to understand. I want you to use it. Um, Here's the answer to that question. Are you kidding me? That's a dumb question. Social media is fantastic. It's wonderful. We love it. I just want you to see how to use it without getting yourself into trouble. So our goal today, one of them, is to find a balance, a peaceful coexistence between law and social media. Um, I want to do that by helping you find an acceptable balance between how to properly use social media. And you know as well as I do that if, if we have all the, the rules and the constraints and everything has to be pre-approved before something can be set out on Twitter or Facebook and you have to go through a committee and get a lawyer to sign off on it, you may as well just not even be doing it because it's a waste of time. Social media is about interaction. It's about communicating, developing re relationships through this dialogue. And if you're having to go through approvals and all this other nonsense, then you're not getting the full impact of it. Um, so what I want to do is educate you to the extent I can within this limited period of time on the risks of using it along with a few other digital business risks. I want to show you some of the ways to help minimize those risks. And remember, social media is a tool. It's just like real life, except you have everything recorded now. What you say is being recorded somewhere, somehow, by someone. So there will never be that time down the road when you can say, 
oh, I didn't really say that, and get away with it because there's a record of it. Use your common sense. That's probably the best rule of thumb of, of all is use common sense. Don't say things on social media that you wouldn't say standing up right here in this room on video being recorded. Um, of course, use social media. Everyone should be using social media, but use it properly. What is social media law? Um, the law that applies to and governs the use of social media. How about that for an answer? Does that just make everyone feel better now you know what's going on? I mean, just stop right here and go no further? <laughs> okay, social media law. Um, it, it, it's a broad spectrum of many different laws, and it governs uh, the inherent risks. It, it, it raises inherent risks in using social media, and it creates a natural tension between those who are promoting businesses, such as the marketers, uh, the, the uh, executives oftentimes who are wanting to participate in marketing and promoting business, and those on the risk management side, such as the legal, who want to eliminate all possible risks so they're at one side of the continuum where the, the promoters are at the other. So you're trying to find somewhere in the middle, you know, where there's a, a you get the benefits, but you're not bringing on too much risk. Um, as I said, I'm sold out on social media. I'm an avid user of it. If you've ever seen my Twitter stream, you know it. I probably use it too much. Um, and I'm hoping you guys will edit that part out of the video because, you know, I, I, I do spend a lot of time on it, but I am a huge fan of social media. I think uh, it's great uh, for, for developing relationships. The truth is I probably wouldn't be here today had it not been for relationships that I developed over social media that ultimately led to me attending this breakfast and getting to know many of the great people here. So that's how it works. Um, there are two general types of law. I'm going to give you a little bit of legal background on how law works in case you're curious. Two general types, there's codes, that's where the legislatures create specific laws to address specific problems, and there's the common law, it's where the judges, you know, you have a case comes before a judge, the judge looks to general principles of law from other areas oftentimes and uses reasoning to come up with an answer to how to solve the problem. Legislatures want to keep up. Trust me, there's nothing a legislature wants to do more than solve every single one of your problems. They want to do this because that's what gets them reelected and that's what they're always looking to do. Um, it's not because they don't want to do it, it's that it's impossible. Social media and technology in general is developing so quickly that legislatures are trying to create laws to solve many of the problems that we face and that we're seeing, but they just can't do it quickly enough. Um, too slow. For example, back last spring, there was this big ruckus that came up around March, the, the, the March-April time frame, where employers were asking prospective employees to give them their social media login information. They wanted their Facebook login, they wanted their profile, their, their passwords, and they wanted to go in and check out what they were saying privately in their social media platform before they even hired the people. Um, and, and it created this firestorm and it made it all the way up to the, to the senators on Capitol Hill who said, we've got to create a law to stop this. Well, the federal law hasn't come about yet. Um, but Illinois came up with a law. Uh, they're the second state in the country right now who has a law that says that you cannot ask a prospective employee or a, an existing employee for their own personal private logins uh, to social media. And the effective date is January of, of 2013. So, you know, January we'll have this law. Well, it's already been solved. Uh, right now, there was such a firestorm that came out over this to, to employers who were asking this kind of information that Nobody in their right mind would do that anymore because the, the publicity that's surrounding it. And then people started looking to areas of privacy law and saying, well, wait a minute. I'm not going to give them the keys to my house. I'm not going to give them my cell phone and say, here, start reading all of my private text messages. I'm not going to give them my own personal email accounts. 
These are all privacy issues. So why am I going to give them my social media login? Because a lot of people use that just like they use email or text messaging. And so the problem got resolved before the legislatures could really move to do anything about it as quickly as they wanted to. Um, yes, it is evolving very, very quickly. This is my RSS feed from yesterday on social media law. It's just one little section um, of the hundreds of entries, but you see, you know, you have disclosure guidelines and predictions and all kind of other things that are coming up on social media law that happen on a daily basis. This stuff is evolving way too quickly for legislatures to react. So what do we do? We look to the common law. We're looking to areas of contract law, intellectual property law, uh, torts such as defamation, um, regulatory law, employment law, and the laws of evidence. Um, that's where we're finding a lot of the rules now that we're using to apply those principles to solve problems that are coming up in the social media context. You can't protect against what you don't know. So let's talk about applying this amorphous law stuff to some real world examples. Who in this room uses social media for marketing? Okay. Do you want to give all of your marketing efforts to your competitors? Do you want to use it to develop your marketing program and start getting some positive feedback and then have it go away to your, to your competitors? Well, if you haven't solved the question of who owns your social media accounts and you have employees who may have set up those accounts on their own under their own name and are using them for your business, you may be doing that. Um, Question, who really owns these social media accounts? Is it the person who sets up the account, who puts the email address in there, or is it the company? These are issues that are easily resolved by contract law, by deciding it in the beginning, who owns it, who controls it, and if this employee leaves, who does the account stay with? A real life example is a case called Phone Dog versus Kravitz. It was filed in July of last summer. It's where Kravitz, uh, who was an employee working for Phone Dog, set up a Twitter account and had, oh, I think 18,000, something like that, followers that he had acquired over time. And all was going well, but then Kravitz decided to leave and go work for Phone Dog's competitor. And so what did Kravitz do? He took the Twitter, the Twitter account, went to the competitor, changed the name, to now be you know, the, new, the new name, and all 18,000 followers went with him. So what do you think Phone Dog did? They did what any business would do in that situation. They sued, and they've been in court now since last July. They have been fighting it out. Um, they went to mediation earlier this year. They didn't settle. They've got amended pleadings that have been getting filed this summer and they are fighting like crazy over this issue and it hasn't been resolved yet. Who owns the account? Who owns the followers? Have you thought about that with your business? You need to because they could have thought about this for, you know, for less than the cost of the very first day that this lawsuit was filed. Trust me, I do this kind of litigation, you know, where you go down to the courthouse, you file a lawsuit, and then you spend the next year or two in court. And one day in litigation cost more than it would have taken for them to solve this problem at the very beginning by putting it into a contract, into a policy. Um, they didn't do that. They're fighting over it now. And we will see how it comes out. Another area of contract law that comes up often is, are the terms of service and the, uh, the privacy policies and things like that for the, number one, the social media sites that we're using Number two, the ones you have on your own websites. These are all areas of contract law that are being interpreted based on existing rules of contracts that go back hundreds of years. Um, contract law, there we go. Who has trade secrets or confidential and proprietary information in their business? Okay, do you have customer lists? Do you have secret vendors that you don't want to put on your website and tell everybody how to go and do exactly what you're doing so that, that they can just do a shortcut around everything you've spent time, money, effort developing? Of course not. 
Do you want to tell your competitors? Heck no, you don't. Have you ever thought about your customer lists that you have locked away that only certain people in your organization have access to, but that you start adding contact after contact on your LinkedIn? You're now putting these people out in the public domain. How about your Twitter followers? How about your Facebook friends? Are you putting your customer list inadvertently without thinking about it on your LinkedIn list of people you're connected with? Because I do a lot of trade secrets litigation. And what happens is the client calls me and says, hey, such and such just left the company. They stole our, our, uh, trade, our, our uh, employee handbook and they stole our customer list and they're going to set up a competing business. What can I do about it? Well, what we do is we go down to the courthouse, we file a lawsuit, we try to get a temporary injunction or a temporary restraining order, and tell the judge, judge, this is our secret and confidential proprietary information. You can't let them keep this. You can't let them use it. One of the elements of that is it has to be secret. That's why it's called trade secrets. Well, if the other side comes in and says, Judge, look, here's their LinkedIn followers, and every one of these names is listed right here out in the public domain, it's over. We don't have a chance because it's now public. Can't protect it. So you've got to think about those things. Doesn't mean you don't do it. It means you think about what, before you add these people, what are you disclosing, what are you telling to the outside world? This is a real problem. Um, secret business alliances and strategies and plans. Are you careful about the things you post or your Foursquare check-ins to make sure you're not revealing information about things you're trying to accomplish in your business? For example, in, in litigation, I often hire expert witnesses. And you have expert deadlines where one side has to designate theirs, and then the other side gets to designate theirs, and everybody you know, waits till the last minute to do it because the more time you give the other side to know about your experts, the more they can go and start digging up and finding information about them. So you don't broadcast who you're, you're getting. Well, I was thinking about this one day when I went to the office of an expert to visit with them, and I, I love Foursquare. I check in all over the place, and I just got booted out as the mayor of somewhere yesterday, and I wasn't real happy about it. Um, it was actually the, the running trail over by Lucinda's house that goes around. <laughs> and, you know, my wife would tell you that the way I'm looking right now, I haven't been spending enough time there. But uh, the, uh, I check in everywhere. I check in at restaurants. I checked in here this morning. Anybody see the Twitter where I checked in here at 6.50 when I got here? Well, I love Foursquare. Now, what would have happened if I would have checked in walking into that expert's office and said, oh, here visiting such and such today? I didn't have to put what it was for. I didn't have to say why. But it goes out over my Twitter feed. Anybody can see it. What if my opposing counsel is watching my Twitter feed and I were to check in walking into this expert's office? Well, they now know who I'm talking to. What if you take a flight somewhere to go visit with somebody you're considering merging with. And you check in at the hotel across the street from their office and your competitors are watching what you're doing. And don't think competitors aren't watching what you're doing on social media, because they are. I know executives at sig significant professional firms who have told me they have people on staff to watch public information of what their competitors are doing, who they're talking to, what, what employees of theirs are being added as contacts of competitors, which shows there may be some solicitation going on there. They're watching what clients of theirs are being added as contacts of competitors. So, you know, these, these things that you're putting on there, you got to think about how is this being used. It's what I call business situational awareness. There's a lot of data that's contained in the things we do that we may not think about with something as simple as a four square check-in or a photograph with metadata in it. You know, let's say you've got this great new product and you don't want anybody to know who the suppliers of it are, but you go and you take a picture of it. And the picture contains the metadata with the coordinates of where, the, where you took it from. 
and you send it out on Twitter and didn't think someone's going to go check that metadata and they're going to see, aha, that's the supplier, that's the warehouse, that's where I found it. Real life example of something kind of similar happened, <coughs> excuse me, in Iraq. This was uh, a story I read earlier this year, it's a true story. A shipment of four Apache helicopters arrived on this base and, and they were awesome. They were like sitting there on the base and the soldier came out, saw them and said, man, that looks awesome. I'm going to take a picture. And so the soldier took the picture and posted it on social media. I'm not sure which site, but didn't think about the fact that the picture had the metadata of the coordinates in it. Anybody want to guess what happened? The enemy got the picture. The enemy got the coordinates out of the picture of exactly where these Apache helicopters were sitting on the tarmac and lobbed a few mortar shells over. Bye-bye Apache helicopters. Real life true story. This is situational awareness. You've got to be conscious of how what you're posting on social media is being used in ways you couldn't foresee and imagine in the beginning. Who would have ever thought that would have happened? I wouldn't have. I'd have never imagined that at the time. Now we've learned. We've got an example to learn from. Um, this is an example. These are examples of how intellectual property law applies to this stuff. Who wants to get sued? Anybody in here want to get sued? Come on, somebody has to want to get sued. Anyone? I don't. But any Trademarks. When you're posting stuff on social media, have you ever thought about maybe using someone else's slogan might be a violation of their trademark? How about rights to publicity? My friend Deb McAllister, who's sitting up here in the blue jacket, she taught me about this one through one of her blog posts. I, Deb's not a lawyer. I'm a lawyer. Deb knew this. I didn't. Deb knows a lot about this stuff. Um, right to publicity. This is what Lucinda was talking about when she stood up here at the beginning and said, hey, if you don't want your image being used, you know, stay back out of the camera because people have a right to their own publicity. Um, it, their name, their voice, their signature, their photo likeness, they have an ownership, an intellectual property interest in their, ownership, in, in their, their publicity. Um, the key to this is whether it's being used for a commercial versus an educational purpose. Given that we're standing here today talking about this in an educational context, um, the right to publicity probably isn't impacted as much as if we were going to sell this video and collect royalties off of it and do all of those things, then if you're in it, you want your cut. Everybody wants their cut of whatever someone else is making money off of. So, let's say you have, um, uh, uh, whoop, went a little bit too fast, um, picture of the audience versus doing a company promotional video. Um, there was a case where a company used one of their employees in setting up a promotional video and they sat down and talked about the product and how great the product was and, you know, you need to go out and start using this and our company's the best and they spent a lot of money on getting this video produced, uh, they probably did not have someone as good as Jason and Max because these guys are awesome and I really enjoyed working with them. Had to throw that in, it's true. Um, so then guess what happens? After they put this video together, what do you think the employee does? They do what employees are doing all the time these days. They left and went to a competitor. So they get to the competitor and their image is being used on now their competitors website promoting a product they're no longer selling so what do you think they did they said stop it stop using my likeness my image in your video because you don't longer have permission and oh by the way you forgot to get my consent to use it so you no longer have consent to use this image bye bye video go get you another one um, easy problem that could have been solved with a little policy or a little agreement right at the beginning to say, hey, we're doing this promotional video for the company. We'd like to have you in it. But before we spend the time and the effort of getting the videographers out and doing it, we want you to give us your consent to use it. And oh, by the way, we want to use it even if you do leave, if you do. 
Um, get it in writing. Infringement of copyright. Boy, who's heard of Pinterest? <laughs> Anybody ever use Pinterest? I love Pinterest. I use Pinterest all the time. I have, you know, it's funny, the first time I came to Social Media Breakfast, one of the first people I talked to was Jackie Bisi over here, and we talked about Pinterest. That was the beginnings of our conversation. Um, my my six-year-old daughter loves Pinterest. Let me tell you, if there's anything that's really cool on learning how to communicate with a child, you know, they have a limited vocabulary, and they can tell you what they think and what they feel, but if you want to see the world through a child's eyes, turn them loose on Pinterest. Because you'll find foods you never thought they'd like that they're clicking up a storm on. Or you want to see their Christmas wish list? Pinterest. Watch them. Just stand behind them and watch those little fingers just click, click, click. But who knows that over the last six months, who's heard about the copyright questions coming up about Pinterest? Um, there's a lot of issues that are being raised about people taking images from others and reposting them and using them on their storyboard. Okay, a lot of folks think, oh, well, all I have to do is give attribution. You know, we learned this in college. You can use a big old block quote from someone else as long as you attribute it to the source, right? Well, that gets you out of plagiarism, but that doesn't necessarily prevent you from violating someone's copyright because just attributing a work to someone else doesn't mean you can take it and use it however you want. Um, when you infringe someone's copyright under the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, they will often send you a takedown notice and say, you've got this, you're using it improperly, I have the copyright to it. Get it off your website, get it off your Facebook page, uh, you know, take it off your LinkedIn profile, whatever. Who heard this past week, maybe two weeks, uh, that Google's now changing the way part of their ultra super top secret algorithm that they use you know, for page rankings, and they're gonna penalize people or companies that have too many uh, DMCA takedown notices because they're, they're willful infringers of copyright in Google's eyes, and because they're doing that, Google wants to punish them um, so they're lowering them in the search engine rankings. Uh, something you need to think about. So let's go back for a minute and let me ask you, when I put up that picture at the very beginning of that crazy judge, did any of you stop for just a second and think in your mind, hmm, I wonder if this guy had the rights to use that picture? You did, Deb. I knew you did. Um, I wonder if he had the rights to use this picture. Did anybody else think about that? It's a good question. You need to ask it. What about if I would have put it, you know, in a marketing brochure, put it on my website? I've got it on my slide share. I've got it loaded up. By the way, in case you haven't, uh, we aren't monitoring Twitter, the slides should be out on Twitter, or Twitter now um, through slide share. But, that's a great question that you need to be thinking about. You need to think about it if you have employees who are sending out blog posts for you and they think, oh, I'll just go to Google Images and just find something on Google Images and if it's sitting there in Google Images, surely I can use it, right? Heck no, not necessarily, maybe, maybe not. Just because it's available on the internet doesn't mean you can take it and use it. Anybody want to guess other than you, Deb, at what the penalty is for violating someone's copyright if you willfully infringe their copyright? It starts at around $125,000 per work infringed. Per work infringed, so if you have 10 images that you just loaded onto a blog post that you didn't have the rights to use, multiply 10 times 125,000, and I'm not a math guy, but I know that one. It's big. It's big, I'll just leave it at big. Um, that's why I went to law school, so I didn't have to do math. <laughs> but you gotta think about those things. Um, you must have a license to use someone else's work. It's not just images, voice recordings, videos, um, you know, uh, excerpts out of books, magazines, things like that pieces of people's website. You know, you see sometimes where someone 
will take a screenshot of someone else's website and use it. Well, they have, that's their work. They have a proprietary interest in the visual image of what they've created. And if you're not careful, you can infringe their copyright. You need a license to use these things, or you need a creative commons. So here's my example of this crazy judge. Look right here, and you'll see right there it says submitter, and it says license. Attribution 3.0. This is a Creative Commons license, and it's where they'll allow you to use it, but you have to give attribution to the Attribution 3.0. Okay, so here's an image of what this license looks like. And if you look down here, it says Attribution. You must attribute the work in a manner specified by the author uh, or license or blah, blah, blah. So what am I going to do? For that image. I'm going to attribute it to the only thing I could because this is what was available on the website. This is the person who uploaded it and this is the website. Now in this case by, by attributing it to the person who created the work, I now have a license to use it. But if I don't attribute it, then I don't have a license. Now fortunately this image has all of this information embedded in it so, you know, within the metadata, so it's kind of already attributed if someone were to right click on it. Um, who wants to get sued even more? Come on, anybody. Just suing for infringement wasn't enough. Who wants to, to get sued some more? What you and your employees say can hurt you. And they can hurt, it can hurt them too if they're not careful. What does it mean to say something on the internet? What does it mean to say something in social media? Well, there's a case out right now called Bland versus Roberts. It's the Facebook like case. This uh, was decided back in the spring of this year and is now being appealed by uh, Facebook and by the ACLU and I believe the Electronic Frontier Foundation and probably some more organizations. This case dealt with an employee who was a sheriff's deputy um, who uh, the sheriff was up for re-election and one of the other sheriff's deputies was running against him. Well, this deputy was aligned with the guy running against the incumbent and went and liked his Facebook page, the, the challenger to the sheriff. So have you ever heard the old saying, if you're going to attack the king, you better kill him? This is a great example of that because the sheriff got re-elected and what's the first thing he did? went and found everybody who worked for him that went and liked this Facebook page and fired him. So this deputy comes and sues and says, you know, we have a free speech right and blah, blah, blah. I'm not here to talk about free speech because that could be a week-long discussion. The point of the case is the judge said, I don't think it is a free speech right because you weren't exercising speech and clicking the like button. Well, every commentator that has seen this has said that is exactly wrong. The judge got it wrong and it should get overturned on appeal because something as simple as a like or a plus one or a favorite or a share is some, it, it is an expression. It is expressing a, a, an opinion in one way or another and it does, it should qualify as speech. So even doing something as simple as liking a page could get you in trouble or get your employees in trouble if they were to do that or if they do that on your, your company social media account. Um, so what they say can hurt and something as simple as a like can be considered saying something. So remember that. Um, tortious interference. That's a tort that we use all the time here in the great state of Texas when we want to go sue somebody for meddling in something that wasn't their business. You know, when, when it's I have a contractual relationship with Lucinda over here and, and someone goes and starts trying to interfere with that by, you know, telling her false information about me. What if they're posting it on Facebook and say, and this lawyer up here is a liar, a cheater, and a scoundrel. Well, I'm a lawyer, so they probably are saying that, <laughs> but it's not true. Not all lawyers are that way. But um, you know, and, and it causes Lucinda to say, I don't want to do business with this guy anymore. So she terminates the contract. 
Well, now I'm going to go and I'm going to sue the person who was saying that for tortiously interfering with our relationship. Defamation, libel, slander, business defamation. Um, this, you know, these are, these are things where we could talk all day about what it is, but it's basically talking bad about somebody. Um, one of the things you got to remember about the defamation laws are it applies to factual statements. It has to be what, what appears to be a factual statement about somebody, not just an opinion. Not like, you know, uh, you know telling Lucinda, Sean Tuma, I don't like him. He, you know, generally a bad guy. I'm not really telling you why, but he, we don't like him. Don't, don't deal with him. That's probably not a defamation issue because they're not making a factual statement. Now, if they went and said, he stole $10,000 from me on this day, and I have proof of it, and they put that on a Twitter feed, and they go tell the whole world, or they put it in a Yelp, or you know something like that, then they better be able to back it up, because if not, they may very well get sued for it, because they're now making what is a factual type of assertion, so it better be true. False advertising and false warranties. Um, you know, I, I like to tell a story. I got to see the guy presenting who uh, worked for AT&T, and he was talking about how, you know, just their social media strategy and all the innovative things they were doing. And it reminded me of my own personal experience with AT&T. Um, I had an issue with my UVerse one night, and I got very frustrated about it. So I did what any rational, reasonable person would do. I took to Twitter and said, I'm sick of dealing with AT&T UVerse. Does anyone have a better provider that they like more? And I tweeted that out to the world. Um, within about 15 minutes, I got a response from an AT&T person who was monitoring the Twitter stream for references to AT&T. And they said, how can we help you? What can we do to fix the problem? And before long, my problem was solved, and it's worked fine ever since. Now, that was a great use of social media. Brilliant use. I love that. But what if that person would have responded and said, I guarantee you we will have this problem fixed, and you will never have a problem with AT&T UVerse again. Have they just given me a false warranty? Or are they falsely advertising? Maybe. Because... You know, you don't have to have a contract written, you know, on, on sheepskin, signed in your blood to have a binding contract. You don't, have to have, you don't have to pay a lawyer thousands of dollars to come up with this really thickly worded document. Because, you know, a lot of times we charge by the word. So that's why you get all these extra words in there. But you don't have to have that. You can have a napkin that writes out your terms. You can have an oral contract. You can have a contract over Twitter, okay? So if someone makes a false claim or a false promise, you need, you know, you, you got to monitor what they're doing. Um, fraud, negligent misrepresentation, saying things that aren't necessarily true. Um, you don't want your employees doing that kind of stuff. Online impersonation, there's a law against that. It's a crime in Texas. Harassment and cyberbullying. I see I've been a little long-winded, so I'm going to speed it up a little bit. Um, who wants to get investigated by the feds? I don't know if you know this, but the Hyundai commercial last year during the Super Bowl, um, where they had all these bloggers talking great about Hyundai, well, they were paying them. And the FTC wanted to know about it and found out about it and penalized them for it. Google, this week, in the Oracle Google litigation, has had a federal judge say, we want to know what you're giving all these bloggers that are talking so great about Google while this lawsuit's going on. Um, you got to be careful and know that someone's going to be watching this. Here's a really egregious example of how to get investigated. is a hospital employee who went to his Facebook last year and, and posted a, an image of a medical report for this patient and said, funny, but this patient came in to cure her VD and get birth control. Put this on Facebook. You think Health and Human Services and the Office of Civil Rights might be interested in something like that? I mean, you've got to watch this stuff. SEC uh, will look into false claims that are made by companies in raising funds. 
There was a CIO of a, of a publicly traded company who came out of a board meeting and tweeted, board meeting, good numbers equal happy board. And he sent that out before the numbers were officially released. Not a, he got fired. Yeah, and they, and, and they got investigated by the SEC because of insider trading or insider information. Regulatory law. What are some real trouble spots? We'll talk about some employment issues in a minute. Giveaways and contests. You've got to watch these things, not only because of the terms of services, but also there could be the jurisdictional gambling laws, which I don't really know much about, but I know a great lawyer in New York who does. Um, contest rules. Have you looked at Facebook's page terms? Look right here. This is an excerpt of it taken just yesterday. You must not condition registration or entry, blah, 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 upon liking anything other than liking a page. But you, can't, you can have them like a page, but you can't have them like a wall post to get the benefits of a contest. And I know this because I saw a health club that I go to recently had a promotion where they said like this post and get a free session. Well guess what? That violated this terms of this, this page agreement. Hey, you got to read these things. I mean, you know, we all say, ah, yeah, just click it and go, click it and download, click it and accept. But there's stuff contained in here where, what are the odds of Facebook really coming after you for running this promotion? I don't know, but they can. Do you want to take that risk? You want to inform your people about this kind of stuff. What if someone's talking bad about your business on social media? Defamation rules apply here. They say they apply online. But be careful. Anyone know whose house this is? This is Barbara Streisand's house. Do you know why I'm using this picture? It's something called the Streisand effect. It's a real life thing. They have a whole Wikipedia page devoted to it. The Streisand effect happened to a Dallas law firm recently where someone posted a review about them, a less than uh, kind review about them. So what do they do? They go do what law firms do. They sued them. And this one little online review that was likely going to get buried deeper and deeper and deeper as time went on became front page headlines all over the whole country. It's like taking a big yellow highlighter and going right over it and broadcasting it out to the world. They're trying to to, to keep information secret but by doing it, they're making it more publicly known. It's called the Streisand effect. It happened to Barbara Streisand. Something you may want to remember, just this past month, um, a company sued an individual for posting a review about them, and the individual turned and used what, what Texas now has. It's called an anti-slap law just came into effect, I believe, last year, and it's st called Strategic Lawsuits Against Public Participation. And they, uh, it's where a big, mean company tries to use the power of their attorneys to keep people from talking bad about them. Um, they won, the individual won, collected $15,000 in legal fees and another $15,000 in penalty. Guess what will be used against you? Social media, if you get sued evidence. This is great evidence. It's used in almost every case now that we have where there's a social media contact, but electronic evidence is used every day. It's like a complete record of everything you do. In case you're wondering, you don't own your tweets and they can be used against you. We learned about this with Occupy Wall Street. Just this past week, or maybe last week, we learned that the Fourth Amendment does not protect your Facebook wall from people going in and using it if someone else allows them access. So you might post something on your Facebook wall and think only your friends can see it. Well, if your friends let the feds come in, now the feds can see it and they can use it against you in court. How do you minimize these risks? Monitor, regulate, archive. If you want to be really aggressive, if you want to just clamp down on these risks, then you want to monitor this stuff. If you're in a regulated industry, it's necessary. Finance, insurance, energy, utilities. Healthcare, government, a little bit legal. You want to, in order to use some of the, the social media in these industries, you've got to maintain really tight controls over it. So you use things to keep these, like I've seen Barracuda Web Filter, Data Shift, Data Sift, and Actience that are good for monitoring and keeping track of what's said on social media. 
in general, you want to recognize and appreciate the potential risks. Um, decide how to handle them, educate your team and the, on those issues, and collaborate with them. You know, once you've decided how you want to handle it, you want to sit down and talk to your people who you're working with on what you do about this stuff, how you handle these situations, and create an outline of procedures for using social media, and you want to monitor it to whatever degree your particular business requires. Social media policies are a must-have. I use the ounce of prevention is less than one day of litigation example because it's true. Um, if you're going to have them, you want to enforce them. Uh, we try to predict all the issues that are out there, but it's impossible. We, we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow or next year. Um, but you use contracts to resolve some of the issues we've talked about. And it's a great opportunity to, ex to set expectations of your people so they know what, what the, what's expected of them. Um, and you want to put them on notice if you're going to monitor. And if you say you're going to monitor what's going on, you really want to do it so they'll take you serious. Um, employment issues, using social media and hiring, you've got to be careful. Um, social media can, you know, if, if someone's, if you're using only Twitter to hire people, then there might be a question of age discrimination that no one had really thought about you, you uh, or, you know, certain, uh, you know, racial stereotypes of who uses what type of social media more. People sued for lesser things. So if you're going to do this, you want to have someone like a, a third party conduct the search for you or someone with a specific criteria to go out and do this. And I know I'm moving a little bit faster, but I've got a few more slides. Um, Requesting social media login information, don't do it. It's dumb. There's laws coming out about it, but don't do that. You wouldn't want to give someone yours. If you're an employer, don't ask for that. Other employment issues, um, you want to define the scope of work for people using company social media. You want to define when they can do it. You don't want someone who monitors your company uh, Facebook page who's bored all weekend going home and playing on their Facebook and then coming back a year later and saying, hey, you never paid me overtime for that weekend I spent on Facebook for the company. You want to define how that operates. Um, who owns it? Uh, familiarity with terms of service. You want to make sure your people using it are familiar. What are they authorized to say? Who has the responsibility for what is said? And again, monitoring. You want to watch what your people are saying. Using good judgment, just saying use your good judgment is not enough. You can prohibit people from using their social media at work, their own personal. You can say don't do it on company time. You can prohibit them from using your company email for logging in and creating social media accounts. Um, you need policies, but guess what? There's this organization called the National Labor Relations Board, and it's making it really difficult because they're finding that policies that are being created or they're striking them down and saying, no, you can't do that. You can't put this in a policy. This is prohibited. Uh, their jurisdiction applies to anything that impacts interstate commerce. If you have a business and you make money, you impact interstate commerce. So you're within their jurisdiction. Um, covers the National Labor Relations Act. Um, and they find illegal any policy provision that restricts an employee or that an employee would reasonably construe to chill what is called concerted activity. Um, they've issued three reports on social media policies in the last year. This is unheard of for the NLRB. They don't do that for anything. And then in one year, they've issued three reports on social media policies. So they're taking them very serious. Can you guess who they're pulling for? It ain't the employer. It's the employee that they're looking out for. They're making it difficult for businesses to protect themselves. And what they want is they want the businesses to, to be very, have their policies very narrowly tailored. Um, so what you have is a, is a tension where you, they, your policies have to be enforceable by the NLRB, but they have to be sufficient in a court of law as well, which is very different, to cover what you need. Um, here's a few examples of what the NLRB said you can't put in a policy. You can't say don't release confidential guest, team member, or company information. You can't put that in a policy or we'll strike it down. 
Um, use good judgment. You must also be sure that your posts are completely accurate and not misleading. This is in their report. You can't tell your employees that they must do this. Because if you tell somebody you have to be completely accurate, well, then you're making them have to think about, is, you know, I might not want to post this because somebody might say it's not completely accurate. So, can't do that. Um, legal matters. You cannot tell your employees, don't comment on any legal matters, including pending litigation or disputes. Now, as a lawyer, I tell my clients that. Shut up. Don't go to the press, don't give interviews, don't blog about it. The lawsuit's the lawsuit, leave it alone. But the company can't tell the employees this in these exact terms. Um, that doesn't mean you can't. What they're really saying here is they're saying this is overly broad because what if the employee has a legal matter against the company and they want to have the right to go out and talk to the press? You can't prohibit their doing that through this policy. So I've used a little bit of uh, extreme examples, but it, what it really shows is you've got to be more specific in how you tailor your policies and make them, make them clearer and more precise. Um, what are they really looking for? Clarity and precision. Examples of do's and don'ts. You want to have examples in there of what you can and can't do, not, you know, because everybody has different perception on things. So if you give them an example that they can follow, then that, the, the NLRB wants to see that. Um, cyber insurance, I just want to throw this out there, it's something everybody should consider. Um, it covers a lot of the liabilities associated with using social media and other digital business risks. Um, I would recommend checking into it and if you think your general uh, liability provisions of your business policy apply, many times they don't. I've found that out uh, in multi-year litigation on this issue. Um, it's relatively inexpensive and it will often include a cyber risk audit. So they'll come in and look and help you identify areas within your business that may present problems. Um, uh, yep, yeah, okay. So closing summary, social media is wonderful. I love it, don't forget that, use it. Don't leave here today saying I don't want to use social media anymore. I'll feel like a complete failure if you do, I really will. Um, but you got to find the proper balance. You need a social media policy and it needs to address the unique business and legal needs of your business, but it needs to be enforceable in a court of law and it needs to get by the very careful microscope of the NLRB. You need to enforce the policy, um, but more important, you need to talk to your people. This is just basic old business sense. If there's a rule you want people to learn and understand, you want to bring them in on the process, have a workshop with them, sit down in a room like this and talk about the issues and get their feedback on what they think, on how they think they can resolve this because, you know, some of these issues and let them understand this context the way we've talked about it here today so that they're buying in and they, they don't just see the rule, but they see the reason for the rule. That's what makes people a little more willing to comply. Um, and you need to look at cyber insurance. That's all I've got. I'm done. Maybe five minutes over. Sorry, Lucinda. Um, if you want to talk more, let me know. I'm happy to go to lunch, have coffee, whatever anybody want to. Um, here's my contact information.